Let's learn more about Exeter TV. Exeter T8 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Exeter Housing Advisory Committee. Today is Friday, 
August 13th. Um, we're going to start our meeting. We have no attendees, so we can skip public comment. Um, I'm going to jump to item C, and Kathy Corson is going to introduce Bob Quinn, president of the New Hampshire Association of Realtors, who will talk to us and well, provide some information. Kind of just introduced nope, you him. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm hoping we see him up on the. Um, See um, his face. He is here. Oh. I can't see you yet, Bob. <laughs> can you hear me? No, me? not yet. We can oh, hear you. Hi. You Good morning. Hi, Bob. Morning. Um, so Bob has, um, uh, Bob and I spoke. Um, uh, he is the president of the New Hampshire Association of Realtors and um, is going to talk about what, uh, as realtors and as the association, what we uh, try to do to help with um, oh now he's just oh there you go he's going to share his screen too um, uh, you know try to help in affordable housing and also some statistics right Bob yep, yep. yeah that sounds good okay uh, thanks Kathy I appreciate mm -hmm. it uh, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah my name is so I'm Bob Quinn I'm the uh, CEO of the New Hampshire Association of Realtors uh, the Association of New Hampshire we have now have about uh, 7,500 members uh, across the state, and we are actively engaged uh, at the New Hampshire State House uh, on issues relative to housing. Uh, we also have 14 local boards that span the state, including uh, the Seacoast Board of Realtors, which uh, under uh, Exer would be a part of. Um, so we. The Realtors, just a brief background, um, our policy is really two things where we're looking at uh, whether or not it's state policy or local policy. And we're here to promote the affordability of housing as well as protect private property rights. Um, and we believe that uh, regardless of what price point um, housing units uh, come in at new development, uh, it's going to help to revitalize uh, the housing market in that local community and uh, so we support whether or not it's multifamily apartments condos single family uh, housing obviously um, and we'll get I'll get into a, a little bit more in terms of expanding on that we'll try and be brief here um, so just some of the stats um, that we track here that might be helpful in your in your work and your analysis so this is um, these are statewide numbers um, but you, you know, Rockingham County clearly is um, one of the real hot spots in the state. So I think that it's less important looking at the specific numbers for you folks, but the trends you're going to see are going to be um, relevant no matter where you are, certainly in Rockingham County. Uh, and those trends may actually be and probably are more severe. Um, so these are medium sale prices, um, single family statewide. Last month, uh, actually in June, for the first time in it, since we've been tracking, uh, the median sale price rose above four hundred thousand statewide. Um, again, obviously much higher uh, where where you are. But I think what I just want to focus on is the trend here. So back in the early two thousands, um, you know, we saw uh, the bubble maybe before before it burst during the Great Recession saw those median sale prices tumble. They've slowly been creeping back. Uh, we got back up to 300,000 uh, summer of 2018. Uh, in just two years now, we've jumped over 400,000. Um, so the trend has been increasing in the past year and a half. It's really uh, become quite acute. The reason for that is inventory. Um, so this is months of inventory. So. Uh, this is the um, number of homes for sale in any given month, and you divide that by the average monthly sales over the previous 12 months, gives you how much inventory you have. So everything that's for sale today, how long would it take if nothing else came on the market to deplete that housing stock? You really want to see, to have a good balance between buyers and sellers, about five months of inventory. As you can see, we're down to just over one month uh, in July. Um, 
And just a couple of months ago, we were down to about three weeks of, of supply. So that inventory has dropped. And in terms of raw numbers statewide, uh, in 2018, in July, there were about 5,700 homes for sale. Uh, this past July, there were about 1,700. So it was about a 60% drop in the number of homes uh, for sale statewide. And usually you'll see these, you notice each year, there's a summertime kind of boom when uh, the selling season occurs and then it starts to decline as we get to late summer, fall into winter. Uh, in 2020, we didn't have a bubble uh, during the summer. It just was kind of flat and then went down. This summer, we've got a tiny one, but you can see relative speaking to previous years, um, even though I think if we talked to a lot of realtors in the state, they'll say the market's cooling. Uh, it's really a relative term of what that means. And that leads into um, probably the most relevant thing you guys are talking about, and that's housing affordability. So how much um, can a family make, uh, a family uh, who's earning a, a median income in the state, uh, can they afford what's out there? So in this graph, you'll see the yellow line is single family uh, homes and the blue is condos. Um, you, back in the early 2000s, again, during the bubble, we were down to about 100. Um, so that's a median family could um, barely pay for a home. As we hit the recession, um, a lot of houses were out there for available affordability rose. And now we're back down to where we were sort of pre-recession times. This is, if this drops below a hundred, then that's a real problem. Again, we don't do this for, um, this is statewide. I would suspect in Rockingham County and elsewhere, you might be close to being under that hundred. It's always interesting to me that during the inventory shortage, um, this affordability didn't drop more, uh, but median income in the state was going up. So uh, it, it kind of held last year, uh, but this year, obviously, we've, we've seen a drop. So there's a real affordability crisis uh, across, across the state. And again, without question, it's going to be more acute in Rockingham County. Um, and countywide levels, just again, just graphically going to show you, July 2019, median sale price was 389 July 2020, that jumped up to 489 now at 520 um, So that's a 34% increase in just two years. Um, if you want to look at maybe a little bit of the right side, it's, it's only gone up 6% uh, in the past year. Um, but, you know, we're seeing these numbers in a lot of areas. Uh, and there's an article, there are a couple of interesting articles today. I was just looking at Concord Monitor. Um, they were talking about how Manchester and Concord were named two of the hottest markets in the country, uh, top five in the nation, according to Realtor.com. And a lot of that has to do with the attractiveness of the state, uh, people leaving urban areas to try and find uh, a more rural setting. Uh, and, but there's a downside to that chart because that chart was based upon two numbers. It was based upon how many clicks uh, on realtor.com a house might get in terms of interest and how quickly that house sold, uh, which are, and that's really a function of inventory. So part of the reason why those areas are, are so hot on that chart is because um, there's no inventory. So uh, it's, it, it sort of uh, elevates. And in some ways for us, we would either not be on that chart uh, because it would mean that there's a lot more housing and that housing is going to be more affordable. So why is the inventory problem that as we see it, obviously there are problems with, uh, there have been problems in the past couple of years with uh, escalating uh, construction costs, lumber costs, although we are seeing those coming down, um, labor shortage, um, but without question, it's also attributed to the lack of uh, or the, the, the issue with, um, with, with local zoning and uh, exclusionary zoning uh, that makes the development of new housing very expensive. Um, and we tried recently to try and figure out some, like, well, why? Why would a town be so concerned with housing uh, and the development of housing? 
Um, and there are valid reasons for it, obviously. And so one of the questions that we hear a lot was, well, if you create housing, you're going to see kids moving into your school, uh, your kids moving into housing, or they're going to move into school, which is then going to elevate and increase um, local property taxes. So we were curious if that was true or people were just saying it. Um, so we had um, uh, asked a professor at UNH, uh, economics professor, to sort of take a look at all communities across the state over the past 10 years, uh, tax rates, change, and school enrollment, and to see if that was true. Uh, if more kids in school or less kids in school led to decrease in property taxes or increase in property taxes. So he looked at everywhere. And what he found was, and this is sort of a, uh, the chart basically is, um, shows that there is no connection. So you could have, and there have been plenty of towns which saw a declining, a significant decline in student enrollment while having a significant increase in education property tax rates. Um, and you could also find towns that did see the difference, saw the opposite. Um, very few schools in New Hampshire um, over this period of time saw an increase in student population. Most, student, most towns are seeing a decline. Um, and the reason why the correlation between education taxes and the number of students really wasn't, isn't strong or, not, or perhaps even non-existent um, is because you know, housing development comes in if there are five kids in that housing development, they go to the school. It isn't as though the carrying costs on that school increase. It isn't as though you need to increase the, the heat. Um, you don't need to hire a new teacher. Um, those there usually you don't need to increase transportation costs. So um, that's at least part of potentially the explanation as to that. And um, the other, so just jumping ahead a little bit, um, we also have looked recently at um, with the, the, this data comes from the New Hampshire Office of Strategic Initiatives. They track this stuff all the time. These are permits that were issued. Um, so it's not actual housing. It's, the, it's permitting OSI. If they were here, there'd be all sorts of caveats uh, on, this, on this data. Um, but it does kind of show where growth, housing growth has occurred, which towns have seen it now. Uh, obviously, Durham at top is probably a pretty easy reason explanation for that. That's student housing. Uh, and another area that really this doesn't, this data isn't going to show is how much 55 and older housing uh, was created as well. So you can see Exeter did pretty well. And these are, these are all um, communities in New Hampshire with at least 10,000 residents um, where you sit. And but then if we look at Rockingham County, sort of in general, um, you can see Greenland, Auburn, over by Manchester, um, you know, there, there have been increasing housing stock. Again, all the caveats from the previous slide hold. I don't know how much of this was 55 and older housing. Um, but the bottom part, bottom chart there shows in some communities that did not increase housing anywhere near the same rate. So when what we try to talk to state house and legislature about is this is a statewide issue. Um, one town may be providing adequate housing at a rate that is meeting the, the needs. Um, but if a neighboring town is not, uh, then it's going to put added pressure on um, a community, potentially like Exeter. So then what we hear a lot of, um, at certainly, uh, and I'm sure you hear it as well, and, and, we, and certainly a horrendous amount of reasons is the need to protect local control. Um, so when the state is, and we're working on legislation, there was a bill recently in this past legislative session, House Bill 586, um, that would have provided um, both a, sort of a carrot and a stick approach uh, to communities in ensuring that there was adequate housing. Uh, and it, I know a lot of folks uh, worked on that for a number of years um, and had bipartisan support. Uh, the governor was behind it. Democrats, Republicans were co-sponsoring it. Uh, 
but when it came to a final vote, it, it, it failed. And the arguments were um, that it was being upon local control. Now, if you're from, certainly looking at this chart, if you're from Greenland and Auburn, um, you certainly shouldn't have any problems if you're a state rep with a bill like that, because uh, clearly your town and communities doing all it can to ensure uh, adequate housing. Um, but potentially if you're in one of these smaller towns, you maybe understand why you're gonna argue local control because you don't want housing in your community potentially. Um, so that's, we do believe that there is a strong and important role for the state to play. Um, I just threw this in because this article just came out and this is Valley News um, about a project there um, and about sort of NIMBYism, a story of a, a housing a multifamily development that was going to go in. Um, and I think it was a ha less than a half a dozen neighbors showed up, planning board, and had this article sort of maybe they had an outsized role in complaining about it. And it resulted in a smaller development. I think one of the, whatever that was four stories and now it's three, something along those lines. And you know, our argument would be the demand, the need for housing in Lebanon isn't going away. So instead of having a nicely dense, densely built um, development, um, those lost units, I think they lost almost not quite half of their units ultimately, um, they're going to, there's a demand that's going to go elsewhere and it may be elsewhere in Lebanon. Um, whereas if they had just kept everything in one unit, um, it may have been better off for the community at large. Um, and then just wrapping up real quick here. So then our sort of next step for us, uh, and what we're looking at potentially is, uh, analyzing buildable land across the state. Again, another article just today, I mean, it's a housing article all the time, uh, in the union leader about, um, uh, in Bedford, uh, efforts to conserve attractive land and the arguments for it. And there may be, again, I don't know anything about the specifics of the, of the situation. Um, the argument is, well, there isn't that much um, land in that part of the region that can be conserved, so we have to do it now. Um, we're going to take a look at that. Is that real? Uh, is there enough land for both conservation and development moving forward uh, in a community? How much land should be as we're looking 10, 20 years in front of us, uh, each community, how much should we look to conserve? Uh, what's the ideal number? In the state of New Hampshire, uh, you know, with our national park, with our state forests and uh, conservation land, uh, conservation easements, you know, we're probably in the, a third of the state has in some way or another uh, been conserved. What's the number that we're striving for, aiming for? Um, we, um, and again, I just, I'll wrap up quickly here. So where our arguments are, the communities really should look at density. You're either gonna focus on density now, and if you don't, then inevitably you're gonna have sprawl. Um, the demand, the need of it's going to occur, and it may be stretched out over 20 years. Um, but if you can take care of it now, look for, um, and all these projects, that you see on the left hand of your screen, these pictures, these are projects in New Hampshire. Um, these would all be deemed, by the way, affordable housing projects. Um, so I thought they look pretty good. Um, sometimes in the state house, we do hear folks talk about affordable housing as meaning uh, potential, with, you know, a certain element coming into the state um, with crime and drugs. Uh, and I think, and I know if, I think Sarah is here, um, she, you know, she would be better at, um, capable than I to talk about, you know, the workforce housing statute in New Hampshire and what does that, the definition of that actually mean? Most of us live in what would be deemed affordable or workforce housing. Um, and then real lastly, I just mentioned um, something that we're watching closely with the National Association of Realtors uh, is the federal infrastructure legislation coming down. Um, so that could be a bit of a game changer in terms of housing across the country, providing uh, a lot of assistance and needed assistance to communities uh, through everything from um, drinking water, um, sewage, uh, broadband, and um, could really open up some things in terms of opportunities to uh, uh, provide housing and to, to look further ahead in the next uh, couple of decades for growth. So, um, 
that's really what I, I will stop here. I think I had 15 minutes. And I don't know if I went over, but um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you and uh, hopefully we have a chance to work together. Quinn, and we appreciate you taking the time to come talk with us. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll say Kathy Flesk because he's your guest. Sarah, did you have any questions? I do. I do. Thanks so much for being here. I am bummed not to get to meet you in person. I don't know where to look. I'm not sure where you can see me. <laughs> That's all right. I can hear you. Um, I, both of my questions are just sort of about what data we have available. So that months of supply, which I've seen before for the state, what I've never seen is that number for a region. Or do we have available like the months of supply for either our counties or our HMFAs or for our localities? So at this point, no, we don't. Um, we are trying to. Uh, uh, we have a, we have a vendor we work with. So at this point, no, we don't. Unfortunately, useful to have that. My other question was yes. also data related, which was one of the things we're talking about a lot. And you mentioned it too, was folks moving here from out of state. And one of the things I saw last year, which was really great, was this sort of state of origin. So where are buyers coming from when they're buying houses in New Hampshire? But what I haven't seen is comparing that to previous years. Do we have that data for previous mm -hmm. years? Was it really an increase in 2020? Yeah, so the only thing that's kind of funny about New Hampshire is... Um, so when you buy and sell a house, uh, in, usually you go through a multiple listing service and some MLSs in different states, they will track the zip code of where you're moving from. Uh, in New Hampshire, that doesn't happen. So that data is not as easy to get in the state as it is, for instance, it would be in Maine. Um, so you got to kind of go into the county register of deeds. Uh, there is a group, uh, the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority has... Uh, tried to look into that information. They had some data. Um, another company that's out of Massachusetts called the Warren Group. Um, they also kind of look at that. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to, I've seen some numbers, but I think I'm not sure how strong they are in terms of um, um, uh, the, the data. Uh, but those, so then I, I would reach out if you have an audience there, you certainly know the New Hampshire Finance Authority. Um, and talk to them. And it is something that we're interested in looking at as well uh, and trying to figure out the data on that. Yeah, thank you. That's fair. I, I, I think that generally, and this is again, maybe not as, as data driven uh, as maybe it could be, but um, I have heard that, you know, generally about a quarter of buyers in any given year um, prior to the pandemic we're not from New Hampshire. Obviously, a lot of those from Massachusetts, Maine, just typical year. Right. Um, that's increased. So maybe it was 25% and maybe um, closer to a third now. Um, but it certainly probably falls somewhere in that range. Yeah. So certainly an increase, but not a super significant one. Probably not as much as the media talks about it. I would agree totally. I think the media sort of, perce the perception is everybody is coming in from out of state. And that is absolutely not true. Right. Interesting. Thank you. Lovie, do you have any questions? Nope. Lindsay? Um, I, I don't have any questions. I, uh, I'm glad to see you're engaged in a lot of these areas, though, and I think a lot of us sort of think about this. Something that comes to mind is how do we get this information out to people so that they're um, more aware because a lot of this is just changing mindsets. So. Yeah. That's not a question, but that came to mind because this is just really That's, that's a challenge for us, too. I mean, we, like yeah. I said, we have 7,000 members across the state, and we're always encouraging them to get out there into the community and relay some of this information. And we're trying to give them tools uh, to do it, whether or not it's studies and or we're, we're working on a video series on housing um, that we might be able to give, put in their hands, uh, as well as you know, encouraging everybody to talk to their legislator as well. Um, you know, I think, I think, I don't know, I think all your state reps uh, probably voted for the House Bill 586. Um, mm. But, you know, it's encouraging them and talking to them about right. meeting with their colleagues and explaining these issues to them. Um, there's a role for the state to play and it has to play it mm -hmm. um, in housing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Do these guys have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, thanks for asking. 
you, uh, do you have that Dr. England study on your uh, website? Yes, so if you go to nhar.com backslash kids, that study will be there. That's, the, that's the link to the study. Appreciate that. So it's nhar.com backslash kids. And uh, we, we had hoped uh, to sort of update that every other year or every third year. Obviously, COVID is going to have a little bit to say in that. Um, but... Dave, do you have anything? So um, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Bob. Um, I will say um, to Sarah's um, thought of people coming here from out of state, um, when going to open house, I, I'm wondering if Rockingham County is a little bit different because going to open houses during the spring and the amount of people that, like I myself, had somebody that was from Houston and the people that were FaceTiming their clients and people coming to houses, uh, buying houses sight unseen, but through FaceTime or, or Matterport 3D or whatever, there were quite a few um, people um, it was it was apparent that they were coming from different places um, so I mean and I swear it was more the majority than the minority um, but that's just you know going to these different places and seeing what yeah you know and knowing the clients that I had to you know yeah I'm wondering too if that varies by price range what their budget is true higher budget is more likely to come from outside of New Hampshire versus the affordable housing but maybe not it's, that's true. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, I can add there that I a lot of anecdotal information from realtors in the lakes regions um, with that sort of sight unseen. Um, but those were at a price point that are that were obviously much higher than the median. Um, and the other point I'll just bring out in terms of what Kathy's point on out of state buyers, but it, it it's really relevant for for those who are in state, a different sort of segment of the market. We saw a lot of um, New Hampshire residents, others who were downsizing. So they may have been older. Um, they saw their value of their houses increase dramatically. Uh, they sold and then they wanted to downsize. They had all cash at that point, right? So they sell their homes, they have all the equity in their home. They were now in competition with first time buyers and first time buyers don't have that kind of cash. So that was a real uh, problem and still remains a problem with a lot of younger people who are getting, who are losing out on these multiple bid offers from folks who come in with cash. Most buyers much prefer a cash buyer because there's more certainty. True. True. Oh, okay. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay. So I skipped a, a, the introductions at the beginning. So we're going to do that now. Lovey? Mm-hmm. Hi, Lovey. <laughs> Lovey Roundtree, our select board rep. Uh, Sarah Reitzman, director of the Workforce Housing Coalition in the Greater Sea Coast. Lindsay Sonnet. Nancy Belanger. Kathy Corsa. <coughs> oh, Dave Sharples, town planner. Daryl Willem, he can have a moment. Rustine, town manager. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next, I'm going to our July 9th meeting minutes. I've already amended the draft because I misspelled two people's names. My apologies. Um, is there any other um, corrections that anyone needs on the July 9th? Mm -mm. Um, I was there. <laughs> Did I not see? I'm not I on here. Know. It's apps. <laughs> I don't usually also look at the minutes attendance. since I can't vote on them. I don't think you were here. Were you? I was there. She was on, she was I was there. there. I was on Zoom. Zoom. Oh, you were on Zoom. <laughs> yep. That's why I don't remember you. I missed you. That, but that's I, why oh, I didn't write you in. Probably because you weren't here. pasted it from June. Right? I will add your name. <laughs> I did. Um, because I missed Darren on some of the previous ones, too. Um, okay. And then there was the work session that um, we had on the 23rd that I'm not finding. Do you have that one? Oh, yeah. Okay. Are we all set with that one? I did add you to that one, Sarah. Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will add you to the July 9th. So I will amend the amended and get those posted. 
Okay, let's see. I've lost my... Okay, so... Darren, did you want to go first or do you... I, did I, you I have... just want to talk about 154 at some point, but whenever you get... Why don't you do that now? Okay, so I think everyone in this room already knows what it is, so I won't go into it. Or if you want me, well, I will for the, for the camera or whatever. Please. So, uh, House Bill 154 uh, amends uh, the uh, historic tax credit, 79E, um, legislation. And it does that by, in quick terms, um, allowing that tool to be used. Uh, it's an enabling le legislation that a town can uh, adopt, and they can create a zone where they can create uh, housing that would be uh, no less than one-third um, designated for, for affordable housing, which is 80% or less of the area median income. And so I, I was gonna suggest a couple things and clarify a couple things that Sarah and I sort of talked with NHHFA about. Like 79E, um, one is allowed to put the covenant double the amount of time that it is given to, uh, that is uh, offered to the uh, property. In other words, the way this works is your property, uh, and, and this can be new construction too, or it can be uh, remodeling, but if you're creating housing units that are one third, 80% AMI, uh, your taxes on that piece of property prior to construction, prior to redevelopment, will be, uh, will remain the same for the length of the incentive. Now, the town can adopt it for up to 10 years. Um, thus, the uh, owner of the property would then have to, if we adopted it the way I think we should adopt it, which is double the amount of time, have to keep those workforce housing units in place for 20 years. Um, I, was gonna, uh, I was gonna suggest that we do this uh, on an overlay of where we have the mixed use neighborhood development now, which is the C1 uh, district and the WC district, um, but I also think it would be wise if we could do that along in C2 as well, because there's properties in C2, uh, which is Portsmouth Ave, that I think could be redeveloped and this housing could be, uh, and probably would be, uh, adopted and, and, and built. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in C2, Doug's not here, but I believe what I read was in C2, uh, multifamily is allowed by, uh, by special exception. And so I don't think we have to change any zoning. The other thing I would propose to do um, after a lot of feedback is to take the existing 79E as it's used for historic down the historic uh, district and reduce it to five years, cap it to five years. Now we've been giving nine years, seven years and stuff, and there's a little pushback on that. And there's some people that feel that perhaps um, we're going a little further than we need to go. So I would I would suggest we try to just cap that at five. And I don't know if we do that in the same thing. Russ said perhaps we could just do that at the select board level, which that'd be great if we do that. That's all I have. That's why I just wanted to throw it out there and see what you guys thought. What would be the next step to do this? Would this be a Warren article? My understanding is it would be, because it's enabling legislation. Okay. But, but I, I, I just put that out there. If you guys think there's another place we should do it, another way we should do it, I, I just want to. No, I just want to make sure we all understand what what, what the process can I, is. Can I say the one thing you said is taxes stay the same? They don't stay the same. The assessed value stays the same. Exactly. So taxes could go up, and exactly. your taxes could go up. That's absolutely. So correct. I think that's important for anybody that's Listen. looking at it. Yeah, the yes, assessment right. stays the same. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so when we did the original seventy ninety adoption, we basically went through our economic development. That, that has been dormant for quite some time. And we had somebody work on creating a map and then we had a conversation about where it would go. And essentially we adopted 79E through the town of Warren and along with the map that laid out the districts at the time. So I don't know if this is the same process or not, but Darren and I should talk about whether that's the case on this process because that would obviously need a Warren article to be, you know, to be approved the same manner that we did the original 79 So that's something we need to talk about to see if that's the same process. Okay. I don't know, maybe Dave can add to that. I don't know if you know Dave. But. Yeah, I'd have to read up on the HB 154 process because, I mean, if you're changing zoning, it goes through the planning board. So there might be an element uh, that might be part of the process. Would this be changing zoning, though? 
I don't know, you said allowing it in certain districts. I, I don't know. Okay. That's what I'd have to look The original 7090 was <coughs> not a zoning Here's amendment. So <coughs> no. uh, that was something different. It was just adopting the statute and allowing the select board to operate under the statute once we adopted it along mm -hmm. with the map again that sort of del that delineated essentially where the where 79e would be keeping in mind if you read 79e it's it's heavy on downtown districts it's heavy on historic districts when we talked about the original 79e back when it was adopted there was a there was an initial thought that we could sort of adopt a town line over a lot of different zones and then but the more we dug into it the more we realized that legally really we could only adopt it in certain places which we then did to try to maximize the benefits from it so and as we know we've used it since so i don't know if this is a zoning amendment or not i'm going to be but i think we need to research it and figure that out so this is actually so 154 is actually part of 79e so that this amended mm -hmm. 154 amended 79e so does that oh, mean God. that we already have it in our because it is known as 79e and it hasn't Excellent. all it is is a change in the way that it's used and if we were going to change it to the only one we would need to do is c2 then so that's a bad cross question i think my from my conversations with nifa that we would still need to designate housing opportunity zones but then yes, we don't have to make any other changes unless we want to make changes like 10 years and double the incentive. Yeah. Mm. So we have work to do on this. Yeah. The other question would be, how do you, because I know we do have some workforce housing units and that's always confusing when they come up for sale. So how do you, um, how do you monitor, and how does a town monitor this from you know making sure that if somebody leaves you they actually are um sticking to what we'd have to know. probably figure out some, yeah. some one of us me probably would have to i mean you know usually yeah. there's a deed restriction on workforce housing yeah. right? right so yeah. so it yeah, comes up right. then we could make them do that but right. but no because it wouldn't come up if it's a rental unit they don't look at the deed right so you probably have to look at the the lease and the lease has to stay the same but somehow it's just it's it's you, kind of like anything you, you, yeah. you have to get to make it work uh you have to get a monitoring agent and it's in the deed it's in the thing and then there's for rentals and sales are treated differently uh rentals are like an annual report through the monitoring agent that checks all the you know the rent uh, pricing and so forth to make sure it's consistent with it and gives a you know certificate like a, 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 a permit you know right. basically right. Uh, saying yeah you're you're in compliance or you know, right. an annual compliance check uh, when property transfers the monitoring agent acts as like an intermediary to see the make sure the purchase price meets the you know the G, you know because yeah, right. it's all tied to you know consumer price index and so forth and how much it can sell so they do it we have uh, we have a lady that does it for uh, no, for watching roads. Watching roads. Uh, yeah. She had left, and now we have a gentleman in Rye that, that um, will do it as pe you know as it comes up. Okay. But rentals are definitely a lot more. Mm, yeah. Oh, okay. Right. That's and good. Somehow show. for rentals, because annual sales, you can pay the monitoring agent based on a percentage of the price. So right. it's like one percent or one and a half percent uh, cut for the for the fee for the monitoring agent wow. to, to bring it you know through yeah. the process. Uh, but with rentals, you'd have to figure out some sort of who's paying that, what it is. So how do you monitor, like Squam Scott has workforce housing, is there any monitor of that? I don't know. I wonder. That's a good question. That's yeah. Nathan's end. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. It's a it's, good question how he, I mean, that's, that's a good person to to contact to say, how do you do this? Or is like the government, you know, what maybe he doesn't. I think we'd start on something like Squam's Good Block with the assessing office. Yep. find out if there's a filing that they have to make every year with the assessing office to yeah. end yeah. up in a value advantaged uh, area right so basically for tax credit purposes or however they may be plugged into that, ah. those programs yep so we can we'll consult with the assessing office and see if they're getting any kind of annual filing on that it's kind of like rent control in boston you know yeah it's like good question Yes. And my understanding with this too is that the housing opportunity zones will not apply to for sale. It'll only be rental, and it's because the developer wouldn't 
be able to reap the benefits of the tax incentive because they'd be selling the property. And then are we reducing mm -hmm. the taxes, or, you know, freezing that assessed value for the individual homeowners? I don't think so. I think this is just going to be for rental properties. It's always been confusing with 79E because when it condoizes, what do you, how do you, how do you yeah. make sure everybody gets their fair share? Well, yeah. no, that, that, one, that one we've done. We did that with Tony. Yeah, but it wasn't like something where it's, it, it was developed into condos and oh, you have to, right. you know, figure out who gets the advantage. Yeah. You know? Yep. I don't know. Yeah. Questions? My, my biggest kind of concern with this is like, it only goes double the incentive. So if you cap it at five years, that's 10 years. I mean, think of back to 2011, it was like yesterday. So people are gonna start looking at these numbers, oh, I'll take advantage of this because I get a you know massive tax break. Right. And then at year 10, I jack up the rent on the four units, 10 units, 20 units that are affordable. Yep. And this this works for a long-term investment. So it really doesn't, so I don't see how it solves a long-term issue. So right. the, I mean, because we, we had talked about this yeah. plan for it during the month. There are different ways to do it. 30 years, 40 years. I wish. We settled on I asked if I could make it. That, uh, that, that solves, yeah. you know, yeah. like the issue in perpetuity. You right. don't want to be re revisiting it in five years, 10 years, seven years, whatever double the incentive is given. You know, it's four years, it's eight years, it's two years, it's four years. I mean, and then it becomes market rate. So, I mean, maximum, you know, 10 years under a cap of five years incentive. I think. So I, I don't know if it's, is that the problem we're trying to solve, I guess, is, you know. Right, it's just so a temporary thought from that. Oh, So, the only that right now we have a tool that we can use. And I believe this tool will lead to an increased amount of housing, which we need. Workforce housing, we need the most we need housing as well. Plus, it's, it's not greenfield development. It's not uh, like you want density. But my plan and Sarah's plan is to go right back to the legislature next year and make this one five four and put it. I think we'll get it. But at, at least we get 20 years, up to 20 years of however many units. You know, that's, and you said you wanted to cap it five. No, no, I want to cap the 79E that exists at five. It's the, uh, what I want to do is to the housing opportunity, housing opportunity zones, I want to do 10 years so we can get 20 years of value. But I want to take what is now up to 413 was the, the highest number is right now. Yeah, I want to drop that all the way down to five, just like Conger did. Just drop it down to five because I, I think we're giving away too much. I, I, that's a lot of feedback I'm getting. So I don't know if you guys agree with that or not. I, I do. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I would look into it to see if you can, instead of having the legislature change it, can we change it and adopt it with our own? No. no. The only thing we can redo is reduce the um, the AMI. So we could say that the units have to be affordable at sixty percent instead of because eighty percent is a lot here. Yeah. But that's the only thing we can do because it's a maximum of ten years and we can't do more than double the incentive. Right. Which is a bummer. But that's now. Hopefully, we can get yeah. that change. Yeah, that should be fixed. That's, we've done it for other legislation. We are up to the good. I see what you're saying, though, Dave, I tot and I totally agree with that. I am hopeful it's a, right, a move in the right direction and we can make it what we want. Well, and it also sort of forces our hand to do 10 years of incentives because then we can get the 20 years of affordability and anything less than that just seems silly. Have we done the numbers on, like, do you have any numbers on a sample project to see what it, what it means to the town? No, that's a great idea, though. Yeah. Mm. I do I mean, see this project's different. You know, if you have to right. add infrastructure, then it's a whole new ball game. But yeah. you know, assuming you know, take a couple of different scenarios and saying, okay, this is what we'd be giving away, and do the math. Yeah. My hope was to use this in in, in combination with the money and on, on a place like um, on a place like uh, uh, Matt Burke's property. Where he has the he has the Los Solas and then he has all kinds of grand plans for that property next to it. Yep. That that could be fantastic. Yeah. That could be a lot of units plus some commercial on the bottom. But then he has to commit. I'm I'm, I'm you know, a knee jerk. That's that's good. But then he has to commit to in perpetuity for the affordable component because that's what the bond requires. That's great. So that's oh, that's interesting. Great. We did a flexible zoning uh, kind of thing on that. Did you ever see that? I did, yeah. Yeah, but I see the, th I see the, um, you know, you increase the supply, so that 
I see your your incentive of yeah I know it's only temporary but then we have more units and maybe the price you know goes down or and you have some units that are not as um, they're not going to build them the same as the higher priced units so you 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 have to rent them for less you know it doesn't have the granite countertops it doesn't have the you know it has smaller rooms whatever so there is there it, they may stay somewhat affordable not as affordable as we'd like but you know so you do get to some point you don't get to because watson woods when you go into them the workforce housing <coughs> units are much less um there's there's not the frills they're smaller um and you can tell you can tell just by looking on the outside but you know they're very um sometimes it's hard to find people to even that that uh, fit that that workforce housing that's a you really know. good point i didn't even think of that there's nothing in here that says you can't do that that's what they'll do Right, no, they will. A, a developer will develop it in a different manner, um, the units. We, we addressed that in the month, mm -hmm. that you, it had to be the same, similar cool. materials, similar methods of construction, so you can't just, yeah, oh. okay. Okay, <laughs> interesting. But see, in the long run, well, as, as long as it's in perpetuity, that's good, but if it's not, then, you know, they the may not. The month stops at the, at the, well, the month stops where, where uh, C1 stops. Mm -hmm. And the C2, if we did, if we adopt the housing opportunity zone all along C2, then you would be able to combine the one there. I'm thinking yeah. like Robin's auto parking lot, you know, something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. really yeah, that's a big, big um, parcel. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully we'll have an update for the next meeting. I will, yeah. For process and, and all this other stuff that just come out. Great dialogue. Um, so that would be September 10th. Um, thank you, Darren. Darren, just real quick, something else to consider. If you're thinking longer term where adjustments can't be made in terms of increasing rental prices, there's a downside to that, obviously, in, in that maintenance, you know, I'm not saying that landlords then may <laughs> not respond as quickly or as expeditiously to people's needs um, in long-term rentals but that's something to consider and I don't know how you manage that like how do you make people be equitable landlords when they're not charging and if 10 20 years goes down the line and you've got apartments that are in need of of upgrading but if that's not part of the the requirement that, that you know I'm from New York so yeah. no, <laughs> that makes sense. You know, from a city where you mm -hmm. people were locked into particular rents, there were downsides to it. You mm -hmm. could afford to live there, but is it habitable? I don't know. So it was just something to put in the, the conversation piece when thinking long term. Yeah. So two thirds of the sure. uh, property would be market rate. Mm -hmm. so I'd right. Like to think that they wouldn't just let one right. But the two no, no but you, you you'd be amazed at which one can do in you know maintaining particular areas and not maintaining others so just yeah it's about margins that they you know they're not making they're like okay i can't afford to, to give you I new carpets make, i'll lose money right. if, I, if i upgrade this apartment so they don't they don't yeah. they won't yeah. It's an interesting question. I wonder if it's been something that's been reported in like mixed income developments here. Oh, there. I mean, I you, you you've, I've seen it in communities where it becomes a legal issue, and there's nothing on. You know, there's nothing that says that you have to maintain to a certain level that's comparable to. And so that's that's part of the conversation. Why don't we add it right in? That's like that. Why don't we? legislate that if we can. I wish you the best. That's part of it. <laughs> yeah. wow. You should. Okay, I mean, uh, those issues all come to Doug Eastman here, by the way. The housing. Thank yeah. you. I mean, they do need to meet standards, health officer and right. enforcement officer. We do have provisions. We do have minimum building code standards, minimum life safety codes, yeah. CO2, you mm -hmm. know, it says it's got to work. Right. And so forth. And incest screens have to be in working order. But, you know, the rug, the... Right. The, minimum the is very different cabinet than... Doesn't, you know, the right. cabinet doors, there's no cabinet doors, or they don't work properly. That's not part of the building. Right. Also. And it's not the same as ownership for affordable housing, where, as an owner, you have an incentive to maintain. Right. Even if you're not going to make a major profit off of the home, that you still wouldn't be able to sell it. Exactly. Here. So. 
Yeah. It's going to take a lot of enforcement. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, people are going to have to physically inspect the place. I mean, you know, like that monitoring agent, you know. Right, to maintain mm -hmm. the, the benefits that they receive off of that. Mm -hmm. And then how do they get paid and so forth. Things to work through. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go on to the next thing. But before I do, I'm still not used to sitting in the chair seat and doing multiple tasking here. So I just wanted to recognize that Robert Prine is here from Marketing and Planning Commission. Hi, Robert. Hi, Good Robert. morning. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, Good morning. So Sarah has a handout for us. Sarah, do you want to oh, talk to us about... So after our, um, <laughs> our workshop meeting, our last meeting... Um, I just pulled some some data, a bunch of new data had come out. The uh, uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition's Out of Reach report came out and the results from New Hampshire Housing's um, annual residential rent cost survey came out. And so I just pulled a bunch of Exeter relevant data for you all to see if you wanted to, to see it. So local, regional, and state wide data and then I put the um, the sort of what is considered affordable here per the workforce housing law for you to compare it to we don't necessarily have to like discuss it but I wanted you to have this this sort of um, numbers available excellent yeah the zero percent vacancy rate is kind of sad isn't it it is it's so sad it is and I have multiple communities that are I mean most of my communities are less than one but I have multiple communities that are just zero and that's that's not great it's why i'd love to see the for sale side too the months of supply for for localities or regions mm -hmm. but i'm just sad that that's not available and i can do the same thing for on the for sale side too this is all specifically uh, rental data thank you sarah great absolutely okay and the next discussion is um we had a work session um which was pretty really good um, to give some background so people understand where we're going with this back in January this year Darren came to talk to us and the committee decided that it was a good idea to open up the conversation starting with our local businesses and then expand it to our neighboring towns and even possibly regional. We were trying to keep an open mind, seeing what each meeting, what, what transpired from each meeting. Um, so by February, I believe in March, we had Exeter businesses. We've expanded to economic development directors. We've talked to Chamber of Commerce. Darren, thank you for, you literally took control of that and invited the people and thank you. Except this morning, Kathy, that was a great addition to the conversation. Thank you. Um, so the work session on July 23rd was to start talking about next steps. Um, so we are looking to do a round table. This is all preliminary planning um, in January. So Darren and Sarah are going to kind of talk about an agenda, the, a mission statement, if you will. I believe that was a term we came up with on July 23rd. Um, and that's what our focus is going to be between now and January, unless something comes up or there's something else that any member feels should be on the agenda. Is everyone on board with that so far? Good. Yeah, I had a quick question on that. Absolutely. So, do I take it that Darren and Sarah will work together to set up an agenda that we can look at, or how it will, how it will go? That was my understanding. Yeah, that sort of okay. So, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That professor that wrote that book, that thing, you should get him. He's an I mean, of course, he's a professor. He's an excellent speaker. And his, I mean, his white paper is great. It's like 20 pages and it's academic and dense. He puts it into like a slideshow and it's so much easier to understand. He's a fantastic teacher. I mean, again, of course, he's a professor. Yeah. We expect no less, but he's great. He would absolutely do it. Um, Sarah, did I see you say that you have that white paper I do Could I have it I'm happy to send email it, to, it to, the to everyone yeah people so Darren Sarah's gonna email you that and I have those numbers white paper that he had 
That would be great. I just got them. Especially, there were two pages in particular, at least yeah. me personally, that I was really, I want to yeah. yeah. kind of really they look at a little month. bit more instead of having to try to take yep. notes and listen. And, yeah. Um, um, they okay. just came out. So, our next meeting is September 10th. Uh, Darren, if you have an update on on that, that on, sorry, the, the, the term came out. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and we're going to start focusing solely on our roundtable. Again, I'm keeping it open. We can add things to it if we need. But um, we've put a lot of work into the last six months of listening to our local business leaders and other community leaders. Um, the next step is to try to expand the conversation, see what can come up what brainstorming can happen, right? What kind of solutions, whether it's a conquered level, our local level, a regional level, but we need to hopefully come up with some solutions um, for our workforce housing and our businesses. I think one of the striking things that came out was a continual, yes, there were times that we, we, we heard the same thing from different people, but I felt that was an important aspect of these conversations was that we weren't just hearing it from one person we were hearing it from several and that is our businesses are important to our tax base and when we are hearing from our business leaders that they will not be able to stay in business here by moving away um, unless something happens with our workforce housing available housing then you know it this is a this is not just a simple problem of housing this is housing combined with businesses so and I think that was very clear with our conversations that we've had so um, does anybody have anything else they want to add to the meeting today uh, the only thing I forgot to say about this too this data was about keeping us on track with updating our report right and this data will help with that Yes, and that is great. Um, I, that, I think we're going to go back to focusing. I know this was the year, or actually was it last year? I think it was last year, but COVID happened. Um, Rockingham Planning Commission was very instrumental in that report, too. Yeah. So we, can, we, we, we meet once a month, though we might be having some work sessions, so keep that in mind, people, please. Um, okay. And budget is, season comes up is up and I'm on the budget committee so I'm not seeing any any um, conflicts right now for meetings but keep that in mind um, but yes I, I, I think it's important to, to try to focus between now and January yeah. on a round table it's only a few meetings really so yeah. okay anyone else okay so our next meeting is September, September 10th <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. 
We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.
Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and